Those of you who have yet to decide whether to apply this fall, um, you should let your department chair, dean, and me know as soon as possible. And the reason that's important is, first, you can still change your mind. You don't have to apply. You can decide in November, I'm not applying. It's up to you. CNT faculty do not have to apply for promotion. On the other hand, the earlier you tell us, then you'll be on all the communications that our office and your deans send to you and your department chairs. For example, if I only sent the invitation to today to the CNT faculty who told me over the summer or in May that they're applying. So you know, we sent it to all the chairs so that they may let you know too. But it's better to let us know now. You can always change your mind. Uh, only the tenure track faculty have to just go up. The tenured faculty, when they want to seek promotion, they also can withdraw our application, or, or never even submit it, I should say. Never submit it if they change their mind one uh, way. You're in that situation. Okay, any questions about that before we get started? Yes? Should we submit a forgotten email from you to, for this event that, every, that our chair and yeah. I, I have our to Yeah, the, I can look around. I'm not going to name names, but I see two people in here that are not on the list. So I just want you to know um, um, if you got the email from me, from me or Maria, then you're good to go. Yeah. Or you want to check with me afterwards, that's fine too, to verify. Could but, I hurt the email to chair and just say, yeah. as a formal notice, I'm going to do the or? I think you've already done that, yeah? Okay. I, I think it's okay. okay. Um, good. All right, so we'll, we'll get started here. So this is a focus on the rank and tenure policy as it affects the continuing non-tenure track faculty. Material that I talked about this morning for the rank and tenure uh, to, uh, process for the tenure track and tenure faculty is a little different. So uh, I'm not going to go into some of those details because it's not relevant to you. But I'm happy to answer any questions about any topic. So to get started, the CNT promotion process uh, uses the new titles that were created last year when we began to implement the CNT promotion process. So all of you should have, that are CNT faculty, should have titles appropriate from last year. At the instructor level, you can see instructor, senior instructor, clinical instructor, senior clinical instructor, typically used in nursing. Um, assistant professor of the practice, associate professor of the practice, professor of the practice, assistant teaching professor, associate teaching professor, and teaching professor. Uh, those two combinations of titles, uh, the assistant professor of the practice onward and then the assistant um, teaching professor, those are the two most common groupings of titles used along with instructors. Uh, the assistant professor non-tenure track, Assistant, associate professor non-tenure, professor non-tenure. Those are titles that are available, but the deans have decided who can use them, if they're going to use them in their college or not. Uh, they're not being used, for example, in arts and sciences. Um, your, your titles are the teaching professor category. Uh, clinical assistant professor onward is, is typically for nursing. Uh, currently, that's the only college using the title clinical of anything. Um, Although in some places business schools do that, but, but here they're using professor of the practice categories instead. And then research assistant professor, research associate professor, research professor. We've had these titles on the books, but now they're part of the CNT promotion process. And I want to say a few words because we, we have, a, we have a, at least one person eligible to apply this year who's in a research assistant professor or research associate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as I go through the presentation material you're relevant directly. <laughs> okay. So the principle supporting promotion of CNT faculty. Bear with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna read. This is pulled right from the document. So instead of having to read a 50-page document, I'm I'm pulling out key things that we might generate some discussion about. For non-tenure track faculty, as with tenured and tenure track faculty, Villanova is a community of scholars whose mission is guided 
by the classical tradition of liberal arts education, the intellectual and spiritual heritage of the Catholic Church, and the truth-seeking vision of St. Augustine. Thus, the principles in Section D1 in the Rank and Tenure Policy apply to all faculty members. So if, if you want to, at your leisure, go look at Section D1 in the Rank and Tenure Policy and read that, it will be the, those the statements will be applicable to your promotion process. Along with the preeminent responsibility for effective teaching, the CNT teacher scholar will model the intellectual life by exhibiting familiarity with professional literature and by participating in the professional community. This is a standard different than what is expected of tenure track and tenured faculty. They must publish. They must get grants. Etc. I shouldn't say they must get grants. They should be applying for grants and so on. Um, but in your case, is a different measure of, of professionalism in this category of being familiar with the professional literature, going to conferences, being part of the professional community. If you publish, that's an advantage to you. You certainly would want to report that. But it, if, unless you're in a research position, you are not being evaluated on your research productivity. It's a different standard for you. In short, the standard is aligned with the job you have, with the resources you have available to do your job well. CNT faculty also have the same responsibilities as any faculty member to maintain the Villanova community through responsible academic citizenship primarily to the department and college, and that's warranted to the university profession and community. Again, this is a little different. Tenured faculty have a greater role in the university's governance system because of, uh, of, their, of the tenured status that they have, and they have certain rights that they, they can exercise, whereas the expectations to you and service will be somewhat different, primarily through your department and college, although there is opportunity for university service we now will have a university CNT promotion committee. Seven members of your peer group will be able to serve on this committee and evaluate applications. Um, so there's the departments last year were sorting out what's the reasonable expectation for service for our CNT faculty in our departments. Um, some of you are engaged in advising. That might matter to some extent, although normally advising is part of the teaching evaluation. Others of you might serve on search committees to help hire CNT faculty. That's another opportunity for you. Participating in a panel discussion, helping organize events within your department. These are kinds of things that you could uh, look to report having done. Now there are some general principles for the promotion of CNT faculty regarding teaching. Uh, the general principles in section D21 apply to CNT faculty. So if you look back to the, the core rank and tenure policy, that, that section applies. The college departmental or programmatic statements on evaluation of rank and tenure standards shall spell out appropriate modifications consistent with the titles and expected duties of the CNT faculty. What that is referring to is this effort to say what's appropriate to expect of CNT faculty for service. The department helps define what's appropriate for you to be able to do. Um, that way, you'll be able to report things and engage in activities that have laid the foundation for being evaluated positively on, on um, service and teaching, for example. Regarding scholarship, the general principles of Section D2 2 apply to the CNT faculty, but this is for faculty who are research appointments. So the difference between the teaching and professor practice type titles and instructor titles is the focus there is on teaching and service. For the faculty member who's holding a research position, they're not teaching. Their job is to do research, to work in the lab, to secure external grants, etc. So they're evaluated on research and service, not on teaching. Now they may teach a course, as part-time, as an adjunct. And that would be something they'd want to report and show their effectiveness. Just as those of you who have teaching positions but publish an article or two would still want to list that 
research in your application. Know that it's not going to be evaluated as the core point, right? That's teaching and service. But you show measures of your professional commitment, of your scholarly orientation to your professional life, because you've gone to conferences and presented papers. You've published a chapter. You've written for an encyclopedia. Uh, you've you've uh, participated in an anthology of, and have a chapter in a book. These things c &T faculty do, and it's a more varying degrees, but you can put that in your application. Um, and, there, and when you do, you would want to follow the sort of uh, the, the expectations on how to report that accurately that are defined in the um, rank and tenure policy and guidelines. Service, the general principles of section D, two, three apply to CNT faculty. Same idea, there's this emphasis on the college and departments defining what's appropriate. So here are the general criteria for CNT pr promotion. Normally, to be promoted to the associate professor rank, you have a minimum of six years at the assistant rank. And then there's this provision about weighting. It's weighted according to and commensurate with contractual obligations, or I should say expectations, excuse me. Clear evidence of teaching and advising effectiveness, professional engagement with one's field, effective service to the college, department, university, profession, and community, and four, research and or scholarship, five, professional development in these areas. Now the weighting means, how are these uh, one through five parts of your job going to be counted in your case? Again, if you're not holding a research position, the research and scholarship will not be weighted heavily. It's not, that would only be to your advantage to have done something. Whereas the teaching and advising will be much, much higher and a priority. So it's, it's a way to concisely express this idea that all these different types of CNT positions uh, are, have different weighting to these different types of duties. Okay. The full professor, again, it's normally six years of service at the rank of associate, and then you can apply. I highlighted here the word distinguished. That's the major difference here. So there'll be ways to articulate what it means to be distinguished. Uh, I can give examples of what those measures might be to show that you are a distinguished assist, you know, a distinguished teaching professor. I'm sorry, associate teaching professor, and you want to be promoted to teaching professor. I can tell you what examples might be like that. Um, one might be, for example, that you've won a teaching award. Limbach award winners, uh, some of our Limbach winners, for example, at the university level, are C and T um, So th that's just one example where you could note being distinguished. Another might be that your syllabus is included in an anthology of your of a professional association on how to teach this kind of course well, for example. Um, other kinds of recognition you could report. In the case of research, distinguished might mean you're publishing in top tier journals, journals of high citation, journal, journal impact. Those are just some examples of how you can document being distinguished. Okay, so let me add some more clarification here on the weighting. CNT faculty who are hired to primarily teach, assistant or associate teaching professors, must meet the same standards defined for teaching in the rank and tenure policy as tenure track faculty, meet the same standards. Meeting the research standard is not necessary, as I've indicated. However, if they have published, that may be considered a positive contribution. CNC faculty who are hired primarily to do research, assistant or associate research professors, must meet the same standard defined for research in the rank and tenure policy. Meeting the teaching standard is not necessary. And indeed, the research faculty normally do not teach at all. However, if they teach, that may be considered a positive contribution. For all CNT faculty, the standard for service must reflect the expected contributions of the CNT faculty rather than the standard expected for tenure track or tenured faculty. The colleges define the service expectation for CNT faculty and may customize for the duties of each CNT faculty member. So, uh, what you'll want to do, in addition to looking at these general kinds of criteria as stated in the rank and tenure policy, is consult the college 
statements in nursing or business or engineering. And in the case of arts and sciences, your department's statements. Those are all available as a PDF document on the website of the Provost Managers, and I'll show you where to find that in a minute, so that you can read what your department or college has said, and then apply that to yourself um, to, uh, to understand better the specificity the college and departments have generated within the context of these general kinds of expectations in the rank and tenure policy at the university level. Um, I'll, I'll say more about some of this in a minute. Uh, I like, well, I just said, it. your academic department, program, or college prepared a statement on rank and tenure. The statement, statement purpose is to take the university's general criteria and incorporate them into your discipline. The dean approved, of course, and as you prepare your application, you want to provide evidence and explanations that fully address the department and the university's criteria. On research appointment, I'm gonna take a little detour here because there are uh, at least one, if not two, research faculty eligible to seek promotion. So, and as I talk about this, some of these details will be relevant to you if you publish and you wanna report accurately um, your publication. Because Villanova seeks excellence, the quality of one's scholarly achievements is more important than quantity. Remember, I'm talking about research. Accordingly, the various rank and tenure committees will focus on the quality and impact of such works and of other scholarly activities as evidenced by the quality, nature, and reputation of the publisher, scholarly journal, or in certain disciplines, conferences, pre and post publication reviews, required as written assessments by external scholars, or in the case of certain applied or creative work, other outside experts. I'll make a note here. If you're an assistant teaching professor, right, there are no external reviewers. Well, there, you don't have to get any of these external letters. This is an internal process only. Only if you hold a research position will your research productivity be evaluated by external reviewers. Uh, citations of such work in the scholarly literature and other measures. As for quantity, there must be enough scholarly achievement to demonstrate that the candidate has a scholarly orientation and possesses the discipline and ability to contribute regularly over a time in a systematic fashion to the literature and his or her academic discipline. Okay. What about the dissertation work in terms of the research and so on? Again, this is targeted mainly to those in the research position. Beyond advanced degrees earned and a thorough mastery of the scholarly literature and practices in one's field, there must be other evidence of excellence in scholarship that may include but clearly extends beyond one's dissertation work. The other evidence may include works that are from the dissertation, works that are revised parts of the dissertation and which represent a fresh perspective and a deepening understanding of the subject, and works that offer a new line of research. As stated in the criteria for tenure and promotion, Tenure track faculty are expected to demonstrate continuous development of quality scholarship, and therefore work beyond the dissertation should be produced. Likewise, CT faculty appointed to research positions should also meet that expectation. Those of you who are in a teaching position or an instructor position or in a clinical position and yet have published should also make that effort to show the significance of that public. Why that conference? Why that journal? How significant is, how many times has it been cited? That helps document that impact of that work you did. Again, you know, the teaching faculty are not being evaluated, evaluated on research and scholarship, but it could be a positive thing. So just report it the same way. All right, considering academic work completed prior to your CNT appointment. In the section on credit for previous academic experience in the CNT promotion policy, the department chair, program director, and dean may make a special recommendation to allow up to three years of full-time academic service as an accredited institution of higher learning to be applied to the minimum time period required before promotion, as specified at the time of issuance of the first employment degree. The intent is to give full consideration to academic work done during the years awarded toward promotion credit, which is usually one to three years. So how should committees consider academic work 
done prior to any years of promotion credit if awarded. So for example, if you're a brand new CNT, no previous academic work, no credit, however, you, I'm sorry, no, uh, you weren't given credit, but you were teaching at another institution for four years and had some success there, maybe got a teaching award. Is that relevant to your promotion here? Because it occurred prior to the start of your six year period. And the answer to that is it simply would be considered a continuous, shown the continuous development of your professional abilities as a teacher and so on. So the same explanation applies to those faculty who published prior to coming to Villanova or prior to the years of credit they were awarded. Will those publications count towards the Promotion and the answer is only as continuous as an example of continuous development. They published before they were here, then they published in the six year period they were here, or if they came with three years of credit, those three years of credit are the same as if they did it here anyway. So it's really that six year period. Now I, I, I go off into that you know, and that refinement of this idea because when you read the policy, it doesn't expressly say how we will treat the work done prior to coming to Villanova with or without credit. But we've always offered the explanation that it's, it can be counted as, a, as an example of a continuous professional development. I'm working with the Faculty Rights and Responsibilities Committee, have been for about the last year and a half or so. And we've taken a lot of input from the deans and the rank and tenure committees, from individual members of the faculty, on where we need to clarify the rank and tenure policy and improve the calendaring and scheduling of it, and so on. So a lot of these, th this particular gray area will be clearer once the work on the rank and tenure policy and guidelines is completed with the Faculty Rights and Responsibilities Committee and the Dean. And I submitted the last revision <coughs> this a month to the Faculty Rights and Responsibilities Committee. We're like 90% of the way there. What's that? I looked at it. You looked at it, yeah. So by next next year, things will be much clearer and more precise and, and, and improved. And the calendar of, of this process will be different too. But for this year, we're, we're sticking to the tried and true. This is what we've been doing, we'll stick to it. So when you go to the Provost website, um, either you can just, when you go to Villanova's website, just, just search faculty and student resources and you'll get a link to this page. The highlighted, yellow highlight shows where you want to click, faculty, student resources. And then under faculty, you want to pick handbooks and guides, that blue highlighted bar there. If you click on handbooks and guides, then you'll see that drop down of all those other blue links. Two have yellow highlights. One is to rank and tenure policy and guidelines. The other is to department, departmental rank and tenure statements. That document includes the colleges of engineering, nursing, and business as well. Again, they don't have it broken down to a department level. They just have college statements. So that will provide you access to that, that, that information as a resource. And those documents are up to date. They, just, uh, they don't have all the changes we've been working on, but they're, they're current as of July. What, when you prepare your dossier, you need to use the proper cover page. And the proper cover page is promotion without tenure. Regardless of what your title is as a CNT faculty member, when you apply, you will use the promotion without title, sorry, promotion without tenure cover page. Okay? Um, you find that in that forms directory. So you can either type in forms directory and you'll get a link to the provost page that should take you to this forms directory link itself. And there you'll see the different pages listed and you, you pick the one that's promotion Sorry, I did it again. Yeah, promotion without tenure. Thank you, promotion without tenure. Okay, here's some guidelines when preparing your dossier. You should use the same guidelines for dossier format and styles and dossier content that tenure track and tenured faculty use. So don't, don't pull out the section on research and scholarship and delete that, don't do that. Just, so if it's completely empty, don't worry about it. But you may have information, I mean, you, you may have presented some conference papers. Right, I've already said you might have published it. So you, you leave it, just leave the whole document there, but it won't be applicable to you. If you want to put not applicable, that's okay too, but, but leave, the leave the document as one piece. 
Um, so primarily teaching appointment. If applying for promotion based on teaching performance still provide any relevant information in the scholarship section, you would like the committee to consider. I've said that several times. Primarily research appointment. If applying for promotion based on research performance still provide any relevant information in the teaching section, you would like the committee to consider. Again, some of our research faculty teach, of course, part time. And they may have done it really well and, and would like to be able to talk a bit about that. That's going to only be a positive thing. All CNT faculty should provide information relevant to the section on service. Now, we have this product, Activity Insight. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's a database. You enter information about your work performance in the teaching, research, scholarship, and service categories. It's a great database for that. We have a custom report called the Rank and Tenure Application. You can run that report. If you've completed all the information in Activity Insight, a good portion of your Rank and Tenure application will be completed for you, but not 100%. So you would want to save that report as a Word document, and then go through and drop in information into that Word document appropriately. And I've listed here what you would do. Well, for example, the cover page isn't in there. Right? So you want to fill out that cover page. The table of contents isn't in there, so you'll want to make your own table of contents into that Word document. And then item one in section D, that's your teaching statement, your philosophy of teaching. For those of you who are in teaching positions, this, this is a very important document to write. Gabrielle Bauer offers guidance on writing effective teaching statements. If you want to go to Vital and get some assistance from her, um, your department chairs are a resource as well. Everybody has to write effective teaching statements. Um, and item three in section D, uh, your discussion of your CATs. Focusing on questions 22, 23, 26, 28, 29. So in a few weeks, your department chair will receive a report prepared by OPIR that looks at the last eight semesters inclusive of summer and gives you data on those five questions per semester, per course, and that report appears in your application. That's all of, from the CAS that appears in your application, formally. Now, when you write your teaching, I'm sorry, when you write your comp discussion of CAS, you want to talk about those measures and how you did well on them, how you, could, how you got better over time on them, whatever you want to say. Often get a couple of questions. One, can I go to years prior to the last eight semesters? Can I go back 10 years? Can I go? And the answer is, um, if you do that in your writing of your statement, do it as sort of, uh, 10 years ago, I started trying to do some new things and, and got this recognition for doing that and it laid the foundation for my success in more recent years. So you don't want to go back and pull in all your cats. That's not what you want to do. You're really here to talk about these five questions and explain and develop how well you've been doing these past um, eight semesters and inclusive of some. Um, regarding what students have said about you, keep this in mind. If you want to quote students from the CAS reports, what they said about you, you must include all written comments for that course. You can't cherry pick. But it's by course. So if you teach, I don't know, ACS 1000, that section of ACS 16 students, if you had 16 written comments about your teaching, all 16 statements have to be included. And you can highlight the really great ones, but you, and they might all be great, but they may not be, and you've got to make sure they're all there. You don't have to put everything a student's ever written on any CATS if you use one. It's just by course. Okay? Um, and you would put those written comments in your appendix. You would reference them in your discussion of the CAS, but you would list the student comments. This is ACS section 1000, um, section 1000. ACS 1000 section 100. Does that make sense? Yeah? Uh, in section, uh, item six and section D, uh, these are copies of your evaluation, peer evaluations of your teaching. Now, this is where we have a gap from implementing a program last year with the CNT promotion and where we'll be in five to six years. 
Because I would imagine almost all of you at most have one or two peer evaluations, if any. Because we just didn't have a practice at the department level of you being evaluated in the classroom by your peers. So though some departments were very proactive and, and started doing that from the very beginning with their CNT faculty, and others haven't. So my suggestion to you is, if you don't have any peer reviews, talk to your department chair and ask your department chair to have at least one or two done before you submit your application this fall. Have them go to this course or that course and have them write it up. You get to see it. They write up their evaluation. That's the point of it, right? They write up an evaluation, they give it to you, you read it, you talk about it with your chair. It becomes part of your dossier. Now the disadvantage of not having a whole, you know, six or seven is it's just a snapshot, right? But it, my guess is um, it's probably going to be okay probably going to be generally a positive kind of evaluation uh, uh, because your contracts are continually being renewed, right? So you're going to have a generally positive feedback, I think. But, but it would be helpful to you to be able to show your peers have visited your class, they've observed your teaching, they've offered constructive ideas, and so on. Um, but this is only one measure. The CATs are one measure, that's the, of the student's point of view. Your peers, if they have come to your classroom, that's another view. Your syllabi, and any unique assignments that you might use and create and have success with, all those should be featured in your discussion of your teaching and placed in the appendices of your application so that people could go look at your syllabus, they could go look at your unique assignments. Um, and and uh, that, that helps inform people about the quality of your pedagogy, the quality of your teaching. Have you gone to the May, some, uh, May uh, conference that VITAL organizes and participated in that? These are things you'd want to draw out and mention. Uh, did you design an online class that had never been taught online here before? And how did that work? That, you want to talk about that. Okay. Uh, item one in section eight, scholarship, your statement on scholarship. Well, that's only relevant to a research faculty member, just as the teaching statement is only relevant to a teaching faculty. Uh, item five in section E, scholarship, copies of published reviews of your work. So if you have a publication and, and it's been reviewed or if you've, you've got uh, citations and such, you can, you can fill that out, but you don't, you know, if you don't have any, it's okay if you're in a teaching position. If you're in a research position, you have to have it. Um, and then everybody needs to have the first paragraph in section F, which describes your approach to service. Um, again, we're in a sort of transition period for CNT faculty as we kind of define better how CNT faculty can be members of the department and college and, and serve in different capacities. So I think some of the CNT faculty will have very elaborate service statements because they're part of departments that have always involved them in the department life. And others might be like, well, I'm, I've been on one committee in three years. So talk about you know, communicate to the reviewers of this application what was expected of you, what opportunities did you have, and if it wasn't with the department, maybe you've done community service, or maybe you've done professional service that is related to your work as an educator here at Villanova, and that that could be then um, built into your explanation of service and how you've uh, uh, done that kind of work. Okay, for the publications that you. If you have any that you're going to list, you should designate those that were done at Villanova with a VU. You put that bold. If it's from your dissertation in any way, you, you would put DIS for dis. Again, put it in bold, just right on the same, like in the bibliographic entry of your publication, you would just list those things. Last refers to the last time you came up for promotion. Chances are that's not going to be relevant to any of you. But, um, Sometimes if, um, in the, like in my case, for example, I, I had an article that was submitted, but not accepted. So when I applied for full, I had to indicate, because it eventually was accepted, I had to indicate it was last, or my application for associate professor, and then as it was submitted, now published. So it's just a way to, to make sure people know that some aspect of this research work I did in the form of a submitted article or conference paper was done, was considered at the previous promotion process. 
if you're invited by the editor to do something, um, it would just indicate that this chapter was an invited, invited by the editor. Um, and otherwise, document this, uh, the scholarly quality of, your, of the journal, of the journal impact factor, citation data of your piece, and so on. Um, some journals are the, are, are the official journals of a section of a professional association, or maybe the whole profession. We have in the public administration our one ethics journal, primary public integrity for the whole association. So publishing in that, you would want to know, oh, I have an article in public integrity. This is the ethics journal of the American Society for Public Administration. I go on to talk about impact factor and so on as well, if you wish. But it helps document the, the quality of that publication. Um, we don't collect that information in Activity Insights, so it's another reason to go back and edit your Word document if you have publications and add that information in. Uh, your department chair or program director will provide you a chart of some type that lists out your evaluation scores that you received annually and um, if you've had any um, major review done. Some, some CNT faculty have experienced what's the equivalent of a third year review where their whole performance is assessed and then they may be given longer term contracts instead of a three year contract. They might be given a five year contract because of that three year review. So they may have scores from there as well. Uh, but normally it's gonna be annual, more typical for our CNT faculty at this point. So um, you'll be compared to averages in your department for teaching effectiveness, let's say. For research, you may have not applicable, right? The chair might just indicate not applicable. Um, and service, you'll have scores too. And you'll be able to comment on, on that as well. And then you'll also get whatever the department chair and dean have said for your annual evaluations and and if you had this triennial evaluation, which most CNT faculty will not have had, okay. Um, so that those those department chair comments. Now we are again in this transition period, and I know that up until last year, there's a very good chance that a CNT faculty member probably didn't have a thorough annual evaluation, at least consistently. Now they're supposed to. It says it right there in the faculty handbook that. All the full-time faculty, CNT included, are supposed to be evaluated annually. But occasionally, that may not have happened. If that ha if it didn't happen with you, it's not going to be a problem for you. You work with your chair, get what information you have, and provide that feedback. All right, some comments or something. Can I ask a question on that? So, yeah. if um, my understanding too is. That would be in arts and sciences. Right. The other colleges okay. are annual. Okay. I'm sorry, let me say the whole thing in case people are watching. So, in arts and sciences, um, the triennial evaluation for tenure track faculty, let me back up. There's the annual evaluation for everybody, and then once a, a tenure track faculty member is tenured, it's every three years in arts and science. And for the CNT faculty, you're saying that once they've been here three years and are evaluated successfully in their three-year evaluation, they then only come up every three years. Okay. In the other colleges, there's always an annual evaluation. Business, nursing, and engineering do annual evaluation of everybody. That's helpful. Everybody. Um, so yeah, the, the, the dossier is gonna look a little different because of the different practices in the college. Um, any other questions or comments about it? Um, I think the vast majority of you will have annual evaluations. I'm not, but I just want to, in case somebody's out there is like, I only have three, and I've been here seven years. You know, I, I want you not, like, I see somebody waving their arm at me. I won't say who it is. But exactly, that's, that could be a problem. Well, not a problem. It's just a matter of explanation. It's not a problem. Okay, so your appendix. Um, your document, your application should be, you know, say maximum 50 pages, about 17,000 words. It doesn't have to be that long. And if it goes over a little bit, that's okay. It's not like we're gonna chop off the last 20 pages because it's too long. But the, the general rule is you can tell all you need to say within that 50 pages. You put in your appendix 
information that helps document your claim in case someone has a question, claims in your application. So if you if you've published an article or two, put that copy of that article in your appendix. Put your syllabi in the appendix. Um, letters that were written um, that about a recognition you get uh, for um, an award you've got to teach it. That would, that would be appropriate to put in. So these are things that people may want to look at to verify the claims you make, especially things related to your teaching, if, if, that's, what, if, if that's your position. If you research, you're going to want to feature your, your, um, your, your journal articles and so on. Now, those of you who have published may have co-authors. And if you have co-authors, you should indicate with that publication what your contribution was. Okay. Now, Activity Insight actually has a, a, a field for that, but if you haven't filled all that out, when you fill out your application in Word, just make sure you know what you contributed to that conference paper or that article or that chapter and so on. For those of you in a research position, you'll want to do this. And, in, and it varies by discipline as to how many co-authors are normal. You could be in physics, and you might have 50 co-authors. And um, you could be in my field, public administration, have two or three, more typically. Or, you know, so it varies. And some of you may have done work all on your own. And, and so that you, you won't have a lot of co-authors. You just need to always explain what you've, what you've done in your work. Um, Put your appendix in a three-win binder. If we go with the digital process, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, then you make a PDF of your, of your um, appendix, and you can upload that <coughs> as an option. Okay? If you find that too cumbersome, that's OK. We can still collect the binder and have that available to the committees as they move through. It's like a library. But um, ideally, if, um, if we go digital, then you could use it by uploading it. OK. Um, the, the review of the Departmental CNT Promotion Committee's report. All of you will have the right to see what the department committee said about your application. You won't see a vote. You won't see their names or any identifiable information. But your department chair will give you a PDF of what the department committee said. Um, and then, if you see factual errors or procedural errors along the way, you may write a response to the department report and present that to the chair, who will include that response in your application before it goes on to the college. In this case, your, it will go directly to the dean. There's no college committee review <coughs> of c &T promotion. It goes from the department, and the chair, writes, the chair writes his or her own statement and their own perspective independent of the department. Those documents go directly to the dean. The dean writes a recommendation, and then the university c &T promotion committee, which will be used this spring for the first time, because last year we had some people promoted to the full ranks who will now be eligible to serve on this university c &T promotion committee. They will then read the dossier, read the department's report, read the chair's report, read the dean's report, and then write their own, which will be provided to the provost. You will then decide. I chair the university c &T promotion committee ex officio. I don't vote. I'm just there to keep the paper moving, so to speak move the agenda along. Um, so this will be a, a new thing in the process. It will be another level of review by your peers, c and only committee members. Right? So these are the full ranks from your c and group that get to have this university-wide view of your work. But there isn't going to be a co there's no college committee review. So anyway, back to your statement. If you write this statement, your chair puts it in, and that becomes reviewable by everybody up the, up the line. So here's some important dates. 
Your dossier will be due November 8th. You can turn it in earlier. Um, you can consult with your chair. That's okay. They're, they're there to, if you have questions about the content, have you got everything in here you need, talk to your department chair. They're there to help get this put together. Um, and then when they go to the department rank and tenure committee meeting, the department chair's job is only to be there to provide information if asked, to make sure the committee's properly functioning. The committee has its own chair that runs its discussion. The department chair there is you know, the resource person at the department level because the department chair gets to write their own letter, their own view of your application. All right, now uh, you'll get that PDF of the department statement sometime shortly before the holiday break, around December 18th, 19th. You have two to three business days to get it back to um, the department chair, that, that if you have a response. You may not have any, but if you have one, you need to get back to them three, two to three business days. You have a question? Just doing the math, that's Christmas Eve, the six days. I know. Three. It's business days. So it, I'm just saying it's a very difficult I know. time. And, and in Is fact, there a reason that it has to be that short for a period as long as you make the January 4th time frame, would that be okay? Um, it's up to your department chair okay. because the department chair may be processing all the, all the uh, applications through that department and getting them in before going. They, they, they have to have their material available to the dean by January 4th or the nearest work day, which would be actually the Friday the 3rd. Now, why is that time frame? It's to, so that each level of the review has time to do their review in a block of time. This is a very difficult calendar, as you pointed out. And so what one of the reforms that we've discussed with faculty leaders is to change that fall calendar. Keep the spring as it is, but change the fall so um, there'll be more time for you to respond. Instead of two to three business days, it's gonna be, the proposal is to have five business days and, and move it a little earlier in the semester. So there isn't this time crunch at the very end of the semester. I think traditionally, because this has been in place for about 15 years or so where they've had this opportunity to respond. Maybe not quite, not 13, no, it's not 15. It's more like, I don't know, I'm guessing 12, 11, 12 years. Um, it was an, it was an add-on, right? It wasn't in the original design to have you have an opportunity to read the department report. That was added in as a reform you know, more than a decade ago. But the calendar never changed. It just got added in. So it, it crunches the time period available. Um, but we're going to address that. Okay. Well, it'll be a little tight, but if you talk to your department chair, there may be some flexibility. Okay. That's a great question. Um, I've mentioned the, that the college rank and tenure committee doesn't have a role. I've mentioned about the deans um, and their role. I've mentioned about the promotion committee. You'll get notice of the success of your application or not in May, along with the tenure track faculty. So the, the process parallels, to some extent, what the calendar is for the tenure track tenure faculty, with the difference being there's no college review. OK, I want to answer a few frequently asked questions, and then I'll answer any questions you have. So tenured faculty may not use the CNT promotion. That this process is for you. This is the way your job's defined. And only you have access to this promotion system. The raise awarded to CNT faculty member earning promotion will be the same as for tenure track and tenure faculty earning promotion. It's the same money. It's $3,500 to be promoted to senior instructor or associate of the appropriate rank. And it's $7,500 to be promoted to of the full rank, whatever that title might be. Uh, letters from external reviewers are needed only for research CNT faculty. No letters are needed for other types of CNT faculty positions. 
and shouldn't be recruited either. You shouldn't go out and get external work. CNT faculty do not have to seek promotion. This is up to you. It's as if you're at the rank of associate professor with tenure. You never have to apply for full if you don't want to. Same in your situation. You don't have to apply. This isn't going to affect your contractual status. I don't, I'm not applying. You should have applied. You should have applied. We're not going to renew your contract. That's not going to happen. Okay, this is up to you whether you want to go forward or not. Um, CNT faculty who are hired into primarily administrative appointments are not eligible to apply for promotion under this policy. The CNT promotion policy is embedded in the university R&T policy, which establishes teaching and research as primary duties of faculty. Service is also part of the assessment, but does not replace teaching and research, see section D1 in the rank and tenure policy. Effectiveness as an administrator can be awarded, rewarded by promotion to another administrative position by being given a new administrative title and or also by annual merit. So we have a handful, very small number, of faculty, people who have CNT status, but who work full time as administrators at the university. They may teach a course, but it's not the essential part of their duties. And those folks are not eligible to receive promotion under the system because they don't have a record of either teaching, right, or service, sorry, misspoke, of research that you need. They may have some sort of meet some of the service expectations, but not one of those two major categories. So in a sense, this is a faculty promotion process. Um, so the, the, that's why this position, this rule is in place. Okay. Okay. Any okay. So if someone in that deeper tech role like myself were to start teaching primarily I and mean, the administrator went to a side issue as what they bring up. And I provide enough cats and things like that to demonstrate mm -hmm. would I be eligible to be promoted? Yeah, it's, the dean defines the jobs pretty much of what the faculty. I'm going to stay back here. The deans define the jobs of the of faculty administrator, what we call faculty administrator, and so put in their college. So if the dean's changing your position, we're closing our program. That's what's happening. But fine. So then you'll you'll that's right. Then you'll become a faculty member. That your position will be redefined differently. And you'll I imagine your teaching load will go up. I'm just guessing. Yes. Right. So your teacher, then you'll be in position to apply for this. So it's not how you started, it's where you are. Right? Positions change over time. And um, if your CNT appointment evolves into a, a, a more of a full-time faculty position, then, then you'll be fine. Yes? So a question about, you, you had mentioned that some faculty Arts and Sciences, I don't know if this translates to other colleges as well, are, um, that have dual appointments in the Office of Undergraduate Studies as advisors, as well as a teaching in the department. Mm -hmm. um, they are not considered faculty administrators. That was a faculty position. Right, got it. Yeah. That, that's good. Um, for that advising part of their appointment, which is a pretty, you know, it's half of their job. That's half of their job, yeah. Um, which is really kind of removed from the department. So the department doesn't really have on that part of their position. Right. Is there, what's your guidance? Is there a mechanism that that advisor should be assessed? How does that get brought into this? Okay. So normally for a CNT faculty member, some, some may have advising as part of their job. Um, like a normal, not normal, like a tenure track faculty member might have. Some may do mentoring with groups of students that are not technically advisees, but are extension, maybe they're groups of students they work with through their class, and they continue their projects, they may do independent studies and things like that. All that should count. For those faculty, like in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences that have affiliated appointments to the Office of Undergraduate uh, Students, and do a, you know, like half their jobs advising those students, then uh, I would suggest that the quality of their advising you could get a letter from OUS to speak to the quality of their advising and how they're helping the student. Um, just as you, you know, imagine if you were um, a tenure track faculty member who teaches a course in another department regularly. You, under the rank and tenure,
understand your process, you could ask that other department chair to provide a letter explaining that person's role in the department, how they've contributed to the course and the curriculum, <laughs> students in that, out of that department. So it's, it's getting that information from OUS that will help you and your department better assess um, the overall performance as an advisor. Um, but I would imagine too, there's some interaction with students within your department is happening too. Um, again, maybe through an independent study, maybe through a, a project that emerges out of a class and that all those students, they all go on to a <laughs> conference paper. To me, that's all part of this mentoring that might be brought up. Answer your question? Yes. Okay, you. good. John? Hi, Craig. I want to make sure I understood or understand the evaluation. Who makes up the, the composition of the departmental? Okay. Community? Is it the same as a rank and tenure case? Um, I mean, I mean, so it can get complicated. So it can get complicated. There's an elaborate explanation in the rank and tenure policy. Uh, I'm just going to explain what's relevant to CNT faculty. So, um, CNT faculty who are promoted, uh, who were promoted last year, right, may vote this year on the CNT faculty applying. Okay? Remember, we're going to have a CNT, from university CNT promotion committee, right? So if you have a member, a CNT faculty member in your department that was promoted this past spring, so it went into effect this year, they may vote just on the CNT faculty. They can't vote on the tenure track and tenure faculty, but they can vote on CNT faculty. Now let's look at the other side. Can a tenured associate, a tenured full vote on the CNT? Um, only at the rank, right? So if, if, if one of you CNT faculty are applying for the full rank, only the full professors will vote on your promotion, not the associate professors with ten, because it's the rank that will control that. And um, I think I got all the examples, didn't I? Is that all? I think I covered everything. If I didn't, help me out. Um, which could be weird, because you're sitting in a room with everybody, and you're like, okay, you can't vote on these things, so let's handle this case first, and, you know. But you just have to work it through and, and, and be careful. Um, I would handle the CNT case maybe first, that way the, the CNT faculty member who can't participate in anything else other than one case can be there for that, and then leave. Yes, Stefan. Uh, I got a question about the... Um, your encouragement of us including scholarship mm -hmm. into our dossier. Um, if we're doing that, would you also suggest that it is accompanied by our statement of uh, philosophy of scholarship? Um, if, if you have done you know, more than one of kind of several things, right, if there's a pattern over years that you're continuing to work on, yes. If it's uh, I published one chapter and two book reviews, I don't think you need to write a statement. But if you have, but if you have a, a yeah, yeah. it's ongoing. <coughs> yes. So the question is, should you write a, re a, t a research statement if you have c kind of an ongoing agenda and you've been uh, doing conference papers and maybe publishing some things from that? Th that would be helpful. It's not required, right? It's not going to set you up for. Oh, well, now we're going to look at him based on a research standard, no. But it, you can do that because it helps them measure the quality of your professional orientation, right? I don't think the statement's necessary. This is ad hoc, folks. It's not written down, so I'm just answering your question, right? I don't think it's necessary for, if you've published one or two things over a six or seven or eight or nine year period. I just don't think you need a research statement because it's not central to what's going to determine your promotion. What's central is your teaching. Yes, Leslie. So is there a university CAT committee this year? Will there be one? There will be one. It has to have an, we have to have an election. We have to have people nominated or self-nominated and then an election. As you all know, I think, the Faculty Congress manages the election of faculty to serve on the college and university rank and tenure committees. And so I have 
written to faculty leaders saying we need to have an election to select seven CNT pool professors to serve in the spring. So I'm, I'm sure they're going to get on top of it and, and run an election, and we'll have a committee this spring. Any other questions? Happy to answer more. I was going to ask you Catherine? again about the, the teaching evaluations. So okay. since there probably isn't for each candidate six, like there were definitely six evals, teaching evaluations from their peers. Well, there may not be for c and right. some of our colleagues, yeah. So is the idea to submit however many we have? Yeah. Um, do we need to make up for that in spring? or? So no, no, no. The, the dossier is due this November, so I would, if you if you can get one or two in this fall, that would be helpful yeah, to the candidate. Okay. I mean, this isn't a numbers game, right. right? I'm not saying do one or two just to have a number. Right. Uh, it's to really show the assessment of a colleague of your teaching, mm -hmm. right? You'll have a record of what someone thought of how well you did in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, and ways that you could improve and stuff. That's all part of it, but. It's not just to have one or two to kind of meet the, sure. check that yeah, box sure. off. It's, yeah, if yeah. it's substantive and you can get, yeah. get a couple of them done okay. for someone who hasn't had many, mm -hmm. um, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But we're in a transition period. Mm -hmm. um, and we know it's gonna, we're gonna finally get there in another two or three years, we'll probably have, this question will not be relevant anymore. Right. Everybody's gonna have, that's teaching, we'll have plenty of peer reviews mm -hmm. by their colleagues. Letters of recommendation you've written 
that kind of stuff, and I thought the point was extraordinarily well taken. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm just going to repeat it for the recording. Um, you have all listed things like, you could list, I went to every Villanova graduation, I went to the Mendel Lecture every year, I volunteer in St. Thomas of Villanova Day of Service, and on and on and on. I've written 300 letters of recommendation, and here they are in the appendix. Uh, you don't need to do all of that. You don't need to do that. Um, yeah, you can summarize sort of all the things that you've been doing and engaging in, and how it fits into sort of your approach to service. And regarding the letters of recommendation, I know you've written tons, right? But you can say, I've written 300 letters of recommendation. I've written 50 letters of recommendation. Um, my students have gone on to be quite successful in the major and now are in graduate school. What, you know, you can say all kinds of things about how you've done as a teacher, mentor, advisor. But you, we, you don't have to give us everything, you know, all those letters of recommendation. Uh, I'll, I'll never even out the department chair. One of my colleagues submitted the 10, uh, his tenure stuff, and his binder was like this, good, and then there were three boxes. <laughs> he had everything, emails he wrote for you, you know, I'm like, you gotta be, emails, really? <laughs> Wanted to be very thorough. <laughs> yes? Can you speak to the relationship between the <clears throat> departmental and college level committee and the university committee? Well, for the CNT faculty member, the college committee won't see your package. Well, in the college of nursing. Uh, we don't, well, have, don't have a college committee. We don't have a Well, that, that, yeah, that's a really great question. So um, it's the same group of people that will be looking at your application and advising the, um, the dean. So in, the, in, in nursing, the people who would normally be on the college committee, or what we would call, shouldn't look at your application. It, unless they're playing the role of like department, right? And I, I don't, is, is Suzanne, you're here. Is it, is that committee like considered like a department, or, or is it some kind of hybrid where it's department and college it, committee? It's a combination of the two. Like okay. Since they don't have right. Yeah. So you're really not going to be able to divide that out. And, and so I'm thinking off the top of my head here in nursing, that committee that has that dual purpose of serving as department and college committee will play the role of the department committee mm -hmm. and your dean will write her own viewpoint. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I'm thinking this is going to work in nursing. Does that sound right to Suzanne? You've been yeah. on the committee. And wasn't your question that you asked me though about the weight of yeah. that committee versus the university? Exactly. That oh, that, I didn't speak oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. Let me answer that question. Yeah. Then. So, the university committee, um, the recommendation from the university committee carries, I would say, greater weight than anyone from the department to the college. It's sort of like the final stop. Okay. Having said that, um, ultimately when it comes to promotion for CNTs, the provost decides. And for promotion, uh, tenure and promotion for tenure track and tenured faculty, uh, the president decides. Okay, so we have a separate kind of process here for CNT faculty. The so the new university CNT promotion committee will have an important role to play in advising the provost regarding you know making a recommendation to the provost. Um, okay. Has the university committee um, maybe I guess you don't know yet, but will there be equal representation from the colleges? Yes. Yes, there's one person from each college, plus there's two from arts because they have arts and they have science. I think so. We have a total of seven. Seven members. Um, can I, I want to, and I want to add in a little bit more. So, normally, um, the department committees are defined sort of the disciplinary point of view. And then as it goes to the next level of college and then university, they're taking into account the expectations for the college and then, and then ultimately for the university and, and seeing what. But
But everybody always looks back to what the department says about that person's mm -hmm. contributions to the department or to the discipline. Mm -hmm. This is especially true for research and publications. With the C&T area and the, and the emphasis is on teaching, unless it's the research, but unless it's not on teaching. It's, I, I don't know how impactful these different levels will be because the teaching expectations are the same as for the tenure track and tenure faculty. So in, in terms of quality. So I, I still think the university c &T promotion committee will have great weight, mm -hmm. but it's not you know unchecked. If the department said one thing and the dean says another, right, the, the c &T promotion committee at the university level may sort of have to, like, we think the department has a better point of view here, or we think the dean has a better point of view here. There's the chair, the department chair, and there's no department chair in, in nursing. They, so it's hard to say exactly how that, those committees will view things, but the university rank and tenure committee is, um, carries great weight. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you have additional questions, I'm happy to answer them. I will send out this PowerPoint to all of you. Uh, when this recording has the link prepared, I'll send it out as well if you'd like to keep, have a copy of it. Uh, thank you for attending. I hope this was helpful to all of you.